because I, you know how much I, I, I hate the interruption at the end of Mass with an announcement, because I believe, and we believe, that you're communing with God, and I want to reverence that and always make sure that that's your focus. Two announcements right now. One, we are called by Christ to love our neighbor today, and that means, uh, uh, like, loving them by helping them also, those people who need like very worldly things, who need clean water, who need the gospel. And so my encouragement is we'll have the taco sale uh, for the Honduras mission after mass. Please go buy a taco as well as, uh, again, to support at our second collection that, that ministry, that it goes out to all the nations, particularly Honduras, but goes out to bring the gospel there. So again, you can support it by our second collection or a taco. Uh, I, in case you don't like tacos, that's why we have the second collection. I don't understand her if you don't like tacos, but anyway. Uh, but no, please go support them. The second announcement is less fun. Over the past three years, and I hope you've seen it in me, I've had profound joy in serving this parish. And thus it's with sadness, but also joy that I announce that the Cardinal has appointed me as the administrator of St. Philip the Apostle in Hoffman, Texas. This new assignment will begin July 1st, so we still got some time together, all right? Even though now it's going to be frantically packing and things like that. Um, but know that, again, I have loved being here, and I have loved being a spiritual father to you, and I have loved all the things that God has done in this community and that I've been able to be a part of. And there'll still be some time, and the parish is figuring out, like, when are, like, goodbyes and things that will be. But today I just wanted to let you know, because the cardinal put out a letter, and I didn't want you finding out from anybody else but me. And so know, again, that that's happening July 1st. But more importantly, I want you to know how much I love you. And again, I've loved serving you. And I've loved, it's just been an immense joy to be placed at this parish, to be able to give of the Lord's heart to you, hopefully to be like an image of the Father for you. Um, and that's, again, that should be our focus. And that's where, like, we need to put a pin in that for a second. And now focus on the gospel. Because the reality is, and also, too, why I say this now, is because now, rather than it being at the end of Mass and it being shocking us out of our state of holy communion with God, now we can bring all that. Whether it be the heartache, whether it be the joys of like what God has done, now we can unite it to the sacrifice of Christ. Unite it there, where now with Christ, that, that again, beautiful sacrifice that you make, that we make, uh, in going out into the vineyard, like, and allowing me, praying for me, please, to, like, go out and bear much fruit, fruit that will last. We can bring that to God and ask him to bless it and ask him to do all he wants. So turning to the Father and really trying to focus on him and the rest of the gospel and in the homily, let us pray. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Our focus today, obviously, in the readings is love. Nowadays, though, of course, that word is, like, very misunderstood. So today we're going to try to analyze it so that we can understand how like, love is really supposed to be fully implemented. To do so, I want us to look at love in the framework of, like, in, in, within the framework of three things. That God is love, that he loved us first, and because of that, like ours is to love. So let's first look at God being love. What is love? What does it mean? Well, the word in English actually classically and biblically has four different words that get transferred, it, tr translated into love. There's storge, which is like empathy. There's eros, which is like romantic love. There's philia, which is like friendship love. And then there's agape, total self-gift. Guess which one describes God? Total self-gift. It is in God's nature to be total self-gift. The Father is eternally, totally giving of himself to the Son. The Son is eternally receiving the love of the Father and totally giving himself back to the Father in such a perfect reciprocal love that it is an entirely other person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. Now today Christ says, as the Father is in me, or sorry, as the Father loves me, so I love you. That's something for us to ponder. This, the immensity of love that the Son loves the Father and the Father loves the Son, that's how God loves us. And this is why he says, this is then my commandment, to love one another as I have loved you. Because if we have been loved in such a way, then it should, it should evoke a response in us, in every sphere, in our marriages, in the world, everything where we are, to love like him who has first loved us. And the way he tells us we do that well is by what? Keeping his commandments. 
The way we're going to love God and love one another is by keeping his commandments. That's why he says, if you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love. And this is an important thing because this piece of scripture comes right out of, after last week's gospel and it's here today. And he's saying, like, if you want to be fruitful, if you want to remain close to the vine, if you want to remain on me and do all that I want you to do, then you've got to, again, remain in my love. Follow my ways, all the commandments that I've given you. Now, that can get a little bit scary because we heard, as you can crawl preached to us like last week, that, again, God also said, like, if we don't follow his ways, like, he'll prune us and throw us into the fire, which, of course, none of us want. And neither does God. Because, again, God is love. And if we're a little bit scared, if we ever start to fall into, like, that servile fear of, like, just of hell or things like that, which is a real possibility if we don't follow Christ's ways, we also have to remember what Christ says today. That it's not you who chose me, it's I who chose you. He knew our sin before there was time. He knew all of it and the ugliness of it, and he said, I choose you. I will choose you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Brothers and sisters, he wants us, he chose us again before we had even sinned, knowing all that we would have, he chose us to know him, to know his love, then to love him back and to love like him. Again, this is not merely, Christ did not merely come to offer himself on the cross, like to save us from sin, death, and hell. No, he came to give his total self-gift on the cross for love of the Father and for you and me. Why? So that we could participate in his love, the very love of the Trinity. Or as he puts it today, which maybe is a little bit easier for us to understand, he says, I give myself like totally to you. Why? So that my joy may be in you. And, your jo and that joy be complete. Only with this in mind can we pr begin to approach that third point, that ours is to love like God. If we To understand like, how we're supposed to love like God and the joy that's supposed to be complete, we need to stop and just look at joy real quick. What is joy? Because our world misunderstands that word too. It thinks joy is just like a bunch of physical delights or just a bunch of things we're really happy about. And so it would say that joy can't like be with pain or suffering. But joy is something so much deeper than mere like sensual happinesses. We know that that can't be the way because like it can't be about the senses because angels are described as having joy and angels don't have bodies so they can't sense anything. Joy is something far deeper. In some sense it's too deep for words. It's something found in the intellect and the higher levels of the soul. When the soul has joy, like we can see precisely what Christ says will happen to those who are like in him, that the yoke will be easy and the burden will be light. When the soul has joy, sufferings, while they're felt, they become minuscule in relationship to that joy. This is how we get saints who, while they're in the midst of being martyred, like St. Lawrence, who's being like grilled alive on a fire, he says, hey, turn me over on this side, I'm done. He can make a joke because this suffering of this life is nothing in comparison to the joy that he has in Christ Jesus. When the soul has true supernatural joy, again, the cross becomes sweet and desirable. This sort of joy defies our worldly notions, defies like the worldly ways and it can only be found again in the life of the Trinity, which is offered to us in the sacraments and a fully lived out Catholic faith. Divine life and the fulfillment of joy are tied to the sacraments, unless we think they aren't necessarily. Note where our gospels are coming from right now. When Christ is talking about all these things, remaining on him, remaining on the vine, that I want you to do all that I have commanded you, where are we? We're in the upper room. We're at the Last Supper where he's going to give his body, his blood, his soul, his divinity, and he's going to say, do this. He's going to command it. Do this in memory of me. That thing where the, where the apostles had been looking around like how, in, for instance, since John chapter 6, how are we going to eat his flesh and drink his blood? Because he said if we don't eat his flesh and we don't drink his blood, we will not have life within him, within us, excuse me. So he gives us his command. Why? Because he wants life for us. God wants life. He wants his life. He wants his joy in us. But it's not even just merely for us. 
is so that we can go share it and share the love he has with others so that we can be being transformed by him, being given life in him in the sacraments because that's what's happening. Now he can live through, with, and in us now so that he can give of himself in time to the world and through us. He gives us the sacraments so that we can have his strength because on our own, we're nothing. But in our weakness, with the sacraments, he can be strong. We can be strong. And we can do anything that God is calling us to, to go out to all the nations and share the gospel. And this gets us to that last point. Because God is love, because he has loved us first, called us into his love, as we recognize that, as we meditate upon that, as we receive that love, ours is to go love others. Ours will even naturally be to go love others. And how are we going to do this if we're asking? By preaching, yes, and by living an unadulterated gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. The reason why the church gives us his first reading is to recognize like, what, again, we're called to do. While God, by Christ's like, sacrifices, open up, the wor- open up to the whole world the ability to be redeemed and saved. That's what's being said by God shows no partiality. If a person is striving to live a righteous life and they do not know Jesus Christ, like they can be saved, but the reality is they're supposed to be saved through the church. The reality is that, again, this, this, this first reading is supposed to point us that there are still er- errors out there. We are still called to go out and to correct them and to help people know. But right now, and especially this is important right now, because the world has been deeply swayed by the devil. It has convinced people that love is love, and you do you, and all religions are the same, and all can save. That's a lie from the pits of hell. We are called out of slavery. Christ is saying we were slaves, slaves to sin. Original sin really has consequences. Our sins really have consequences and can separate us from God's love. But he wants to call us out of that and into his marvelous life and into friendship with him and actually even beyond that, into being intimate lovers. And that's what's being pointed at. God doesn't use the word love with all those other three meanings. He only uses the word agape here, total self-gift, which is between real lovers. We are called to share that good news with the world. We are called to tell people the truth that only Christ saves. We are charged with the same task as the apostles to go into the world and make disciples and teach them to obey all that Christ has commanded because that gives life. Ours is to go and teach them that truths held by the one holy Catholic and apostolic church are what will give life and will give joy because they are Christ's teachings and his commands. Again, the devil has convinced people that this isn't true, that freedom, joy, life are found in liberty and doing whatever like you feel like doing. Where Christians know that freedom, joy, and life are found in truth in Christ, and in his church. Our first reading spoke of Cornelius. He seemed like a really good guy. Certainly he had good things going on. He feared God, meaning that we've talked about that before, that's not a servile fear of merely going to hell, but he had a fear of the Lord, which was like a respect for the one God. And he was living a righteous life, striving to do it. But there's also a giant problem with Cornelius. And we saw it. Because when he countered Peter, what did he do? He tried to worship Peter. Something that cannot be given to mere man. Only the one true God may be worshipped. And so Peter, though seeing that there was goodness in him, seeing that the Holy Spirit was really working with him, what? Calls forth. Like calls him into right religion. Calls him into right relationship with God. And at that point, again, seeing what God has already begun to done, because done in Cornelius' life, Because God is showing no partiality, he's calling everyone now, not just the chosen people, everyone now to his life. He says what? Administer baptism. Let's give him the sacrament that will actually give him life. Because that is what God has ordained. Brothers and sisters, all this is to say, as we reflect today, 
that if we recognize that God is love, that he is total self-gift, that he has loved us first, that he has again called us to, be, to have his divine life, to be empowered by his divine life, so that he can, living in us, work through, with, and in us to share the gospel. In fact, it's not a task, it's not a burden. If we're real lovers, in fact, our hearts will be just automatically desired to reciprocate that love. And to what? Having encountered such a tremendous lover as him, seek to love others. Seek to truly love others. To do all the works of mercy, which, yes, does mean instructing the ignorant and even admonishing sinners. Why? Because we love them. Because we want them to have Christ's joy and, that and Christ's joy be complete in them. If you don't think you can do this, you can. Don't deny the power of God. Sure, you might need to study. Sure, you might need to pray more. Sure, you might need to engage in the devotional life and even the sacramental life like more often and more piously. But as Scripture says, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Moreover, the God who has begun the good work in you desires to bring it to completion as we hear today. To bring you into the fullness of his life, the fullness of his joy. He wants that for you, but he does want it for others as well. He wants to bring them to life and his joy and his peace. If this is still a little daunting and scary, welcome to where we are, in a sense, in the Easter season. Precisely now, as was recounted in the Colic, we are living in the mystery of the church. We are living in what the apostles felt. Like, I don't know if I can go out there. I don't know if I can bring the gospel to all the world. And we're living, awaiting Pentecost. And today, pray. Pray for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Pray that as you commune with the almighty, all-powerful, all-loving God, that he may pour grace into your heart so that you may be the disciple he's calling you to be. Yes, a disciple that keeps all his commandments and remains in his love, but also a disciple who shares that God is love that he loved us first even when we were sinners, and then he calls us to truly love him and to love others by sharing with them the truth and the way of life that sets us free so that we may have the joy and the eternal life that only he can offer. Let us pray and let us ask the Lord to give us this as we commune with our almighty God today.